We are on a roll. 1600 playing Krok for Krok. B6, okay. That's fine by me. That's the Owen defense. I don't think we faced this in the speedrun thus far. Um, and there's obviously, as with all such openings, there's multiple systems uh, that you can that you can play, and all of them give an advantage. But I mean, the fr you should defend the e4 pawn, whatever you do. So the simplest way of doing that is knight c3. Generally, black plays e6, intending bishop b4. And now there are again multiple multiple moves, uh, multiple ways to get an advantage here. I haven't updated my analysis in a while, but I do remember looking at one system that I thought was really good. And that is to play bishop d3 here. Yeah, and, and here, rather than going knight f3, we do what? By the way, a3 is a move here. A a3 really is a move, but it's a little passive. Not knight f3, guys. Knight e2. Connect the knights. Connect the knights so that when one knight takes the other... It's not the pawn structure I'm worried about. I'm not worried about... BC, I'm worried about the e4 pawn becoming a weakness. What now? Well, now we can either castle, or if we want to force things a little bit on the king side, if we want to force things a little bit on the king side, we can do what? Not knight g3. No, 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 no. a3. Yeah, we can play a3 and force black to take on c3, giving us the two bishops. I like the two bishops. Let's do it. Obviously, bishop a5, b4. And now... D6. Okay, this is pretty crappy. Now we castle. Now we've gotten all the all the all the development stuff out of the way. Now I know a lot of you are thinking, let's play bishop g5. I don't love that move. I just know a lot of you are thinking that. Why don't I love that move? Because it sort of shoots into nothingness and it allows h6, bishop h4, g5. It allows black to get his pawns in motion on the on the king side. As I'll show you after the game. It, it, a move like that is highly overrated. If you were to develop the bishop, I would put it on e3, actually, to reinforce the center. Um, but if you want to be annoying here, if you want to be, if you want to play this like a GM, there is a move in this position. Nobody has said it yet. It attacks something. It's a specific move. It attacks something. Zombie land, you deserve a sub. Queen g4. Oh, in situations where you're anticipating a kingside attack, a move like this can be incredibly hard to face. Yeah, so we've made black castle. And now, very important not to play bishop h6. Because of what? If you're paying attention to details, it's okay. I know you guys all saw it. Bishop h6 allows knight g6 intercepting the queen and forcing the bishop back. Now the time has come for the move you wanted to play earlier. Once again, as we discussed two games ago, just because a move is ineffective in one position doesn't mean that it's always ineffective. Now bishop g5 is a lot, lot more annoying because h6, you, you play bishop takes h6. Okay, we force the queen to move to e8. Now we practice whole board awareness. What is the drawback of queen e8? Let's think in a very like, in a logical way that seems useless until it allows you to find the move. C7 weak. The only person who said the correct thing is, is Ham, Ham Jimmy. C7 is undefended. So from a logical perspective, you should already be thinking of ways to attack it. Okay, knight b5 comes to mind. Well, is it really the case that black can't defend that pawn? That is exactly the case. Rook c8, you take on a7, and then you return to b5. Otherwise, black is pulled in 50 directions. Queen comes back, you can still take on c7. This is a, a very common idea in certain openings like the king's indian where you're just very cramped right you're just not able to marshal your your forces to defend that pawn we win a pawn now what's important about this move is i didn't just fixate on the king side okay thank you one pawn to the good and our knight on b5 is excellent right it's just like freezing everything now it's time to slow down a little bit, right? Take your foot off the gas pedal. We're not going to mate him in the next two moves. So let's just make some general improving moves. Let's improve our position. Well, what does that mean? Well, we can approach this from several different angles. I love the move, Rick. Yeah, very good. Let's, let's start with the Rook D1. We know we won't go wrong with this move because it also prepares a Rook Lift. 
Now, the moment the knight appears on g6, the first instinct that I have is to chase it away with a pawn. First instinct that I have is to chase it away with a pawn. We can do so in two different ways. We can either play h4, h5, or probably what you guys are thinking and what we're going to play, we can play f4, f5. Why is f4, f5 better? Both of them are very good. But, okay, f6, yeah, that's a good move. I mean, that's why I personally would have probably played h6, h4. Because f6, we have a diagonal for the bishop. But it's okay. Um, what should we do? We're still in great shape. Just simple. Only move. Bishop h4. No need to panic. No, f5 is bad. f5 is bad. I'll show you after the game. f5 is bad. e5. Wow. Okay. Good move. Wow. Our opponent is playing well. But um, not well enough. Now we can start worming our way into whites, into black's weaknesses. Now, I don't know how I saw this idea. I'd be lying if I said there was a logical process I followed. But I just sort of spotted a way to win material. Yeah, bishop c4 check. I guess you could look at this because you're supposed to look at checks. And every time a pawn is pushed, what's the drawback? Well, it weakens this diagonal, doesn't it? And now that you played bishop c4, the follow-up should be quite easy to find. Thank you, Carnison. Boom. Let's get in there. Oh, I hope you haven't forgotten that the bishop on h4 is sort of semi-hanging. But uh, if knight h4, we play bishop takes d7. Finally, we got him to think. Aha, uh -huh, but rook d8 defends the knight, but he's forgotten about the c7 pawn. We're eating black alive here. Okay, but now we got to be very careful, right? Th these situations people struggle with a lot because we've got, like, these pieces and they're sort of suspended in midair we need to figure out a way to just collect everything together so i love the move knight d5 we bring the knight back to d5 and there's multiple good moves we can play f5 but the point of this move is that we're going to take with a pawn we open the e file we x-ray the queen and yeah so this is where that's going to come in handy and our bishop on e6 is a monster it's just defended by 50 different things He's won a pawn back, that's okay. We're not, we don't mind that. Let me think for a second. I have some cool tactical ideas. I'm trying to make them work. No, I don't like rook takes f4. I'll talk about this after the game. I don't see anything concrete. Although, no, actually the sack is interesting, but I don't want a sack. I want to play more straightforwardly. Let me think for a second. How do we want to do this? We can definitely sack and we'll probably win. I have an idea. Okay, get out. Get out. I'm trying to set up a mate, which is why I'm taking so long. Now I'm thinking, let's lift our rook. Rook lift time. Rook f5, rook h5. I have to speed up, by the way. Queen takes h4. Ooh, this is so close to being so beautiful, but oh, there's no mate. Ooh, I'll show you some amazing concept. Now, the other rook. Let's get the other rook in. I'm trying to mate him. Now, black and... Okay, knight of fate. Well defended by our opponent. Jeez. Lift it. Let's go. All of our pieces on the king side. More power. Foot on the accelerator. Rook sneaks into h6, but our opponent is defending it amazingly. I messed this up. I have messed this up pretty royally, actually. <laughs> trying to mate. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to step back with our queen and let the other rook into h4. Got it? Good. Unfortunately, after king h8, it's not entirely clear how to proceed. But I have an idea. We have Alakine's gun, amazingly. We're threatening rook takes h7, as you guys can see. And he misses it and gets mated. Easy. Unfortunately, I... I kind of lost my, my internal balance a little bit. I got too excited by combinations, and so I started playing unobjectively. Who can tell me the fastest mate? But it works out in the end, so it's fine. Who can tell me? Yeah, rook f7. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, our opponent played a little too fast in the critical moments. Kind of rolling. Resigns. Okay. Good. So... Yeah, so the game's starting to get a little bit more complicated. You can see we're playing 1600s. 
Now this system is really, really good. And I think that black, black is supposed to go knight f6 here. This is more flexible. And in response to knight g2, black and black doesn't have to go bishop before. I think d5 is the main move here. And then you get this type of French-like position where c5 is coming. It's interesting. You can check it out. Bishop b4 is an inaccuracy because it walks right into our concept. So a3, we got off to a great start. Castles, queen, e, queen g4, d5, we go e5. I mean, just look at how passive and crappy black's position is. Remember the concept of getting the queen out to g4. In general, using your queen to poke and prod for weaknesses is an underrated concept from a distance. The same goes with queen b3 ideas. Same goes with queen b3 ideas. And of course, the ideal move is g6. g6 weakens all of the dark squares, and it allows our bishop to get into h6. So after castles, we, we're patient. We don't play bishop h6, we play bishop g5. Now we identify the drawback and exploit it, improve our position. This was a critical moment where I started losing my, my cool. Now, how did I immediately know that the knight should be chased away? Well, that's just a common chess theme that has occurred many times in my games. I've shown it before on stream. This idea of chasing the knight away when it hits g3 or g6. Just remember that. For instance, this game. What did I what plan did I execute in this position with black to get an advantage? Who can tell me? Okay, guys, guys, guys. How do you prepare h5? That blunders upon. It's not that simple. You don't just like you have to apply the knowledge. You have to do a little bit of thinking. H5 has to be prepared. G6, that's right. And the additional benefit of G6 is it creates an F5 square for the bishop. Castles, boom. Boom. And then the knight is passive and we take the pawn and we're in great shape. So this idea of kicking the knight away from G6 or G3 is important because this square is what, you know, while the knight is sitting here, it's hard to get to black's king. But I should have gone h4. I should have gone h4 because now the bishop can be preserved. I don't know when to weaken the king and when not. Well, I've talked about this before. Not all weakening moves are created equal. If you think about it, h4 is not such a huge weakness because most of the pawn structure remains intact. Now, if you play g4 here, yeah, that would be a pretty serious weakness. But, but the other thing, I always repeat this, is like you have to... Try to understand whether your opponent has the capacity to exploit the weakness in the next, in the near future. Now, sometimes this will backfire. Sometimes you will say the answer is no. Then the circumstances change and you regret weakening your king. That happens to everybody, even GMs. Nobody knows exactly when it's okay to make such a move. But here I'm using what I the data that I have about the position. I mean, you look at black pieces, you see what I see. I see very passive, discombobulated pieces. I see that my own pieces are all clustered on the king's side. That also provides safety. Does that make sense? The only reason f4 is wrong is because the bishop now doesn't have any squares. We have to go back to h4. e5 was a great move, by the way, but it allows us to infiltrate to e6. And somewhere around, I think knight e5 was actually a mistake. I honestly thought, we should have gone like f5 here. I honestly thought that we could sack on f4. And I'll tell you what I missed. What I missed was that after bishop f5, I thought the queen is trapped. Forgot the queen has f7. I thought black has to give the knight away on e5, but I forgot queen f7 exists. Queen takes f4 also is a blunder due to g5. So miscalculation on my part, and therefore we had to kind of start playing messy. g3 probably another bad move because the bishop on h4 is now stranded. But at this point, I was falling in love with this rook, rook lift concept. And at some point, I think if black had played correctly, even at the very end, I think if black goes king h8, he's fine. It's very complicated, but I think black is fine here. I don't see a way to keep, keep the attack going. Maybe rook bishop takes f5 has to be played, but this is anybody's game. So I got overzealous here. I got overzealous and shouldn't have given up this f4 pawn. And then g3 was another impulsive move. Bishop g3, I think, is a better idea. You know, keep the bishop active. And after knight g6, rook e4, now you're threatening queen takes g6. Now you're threatening this idea. The problem was that the way I played it, we're not even threatening queen takes g6 because the pawn is going to defend h5. You see what I'm saying? 
I wanted something like that, but I couldn't figure out what it was. Here, this almost works. But the king escapes. King g6. There's just no follow-up. Why not rook takes f4 and bishop g8? Yeah, there was a reason. And that reason is queen takes e1 and rook takes g8. Black gives up the queen for two, for two rooks. And I think black is probably not worse here. So again and again, anytime you're sacking a lot of pieces to win the queen, make sure that you're actually counting the material and that your opponent doesn't have 800 pieces for the queen. Very common mistake. In fact, I made this mistake many years ago. I never forgot this game. I made exactly this kind of mistake where I was like, oh my God, I found a way to win the queen. I didn't realize that I'm giving up like a kingdom and a horse. I was 1800, so I was already pretty good. Scandi, by the way. Didn't know how to play against the Scandi. So anyways, let's fast forward. My opponent takes this poisoned pawn on b2. And in this position, I find what I think is a genius idea. Knight b5. That's one sacrifice. I've already sacked two pawns. Here's another one. Now, rook a1, and I started celebrating. Trap the queen. I trap the queen. What did I miss? What did I forget to check for? He just takes on b5. Then he takes on c4. And he's got three pieces for the queen and a bunch of pawns. And he's got like, look at his position. He doesn't even take the rook. He's just got total domination. Just look at his position. I, the queen can't do anything here. I have nothing to attack. Meanwhile, the pawn just rumbles toward promotion. Okay, I went g4, like desperation, but just knight f8. No other pieces. I, I can't attack with just a queen. I mean, and he destroys me. So a good example of not of forgetting to check, like how many pieces am I actually giving up for that queen? Like 15? Yeah, pretty, pretty awesome game by my opponent. You know, it's funny, after the game, my opponent told my dad, um, I was obviously pissed. He was like, I'm gonna keep the score sheet and someday when Daniel's famous, you know, I'm gonna bring my score sheet to him. And uh, I was like rolling my eyes. I, I clearly remember this moment. I was like, all right, I'm never gonna be a GM. So just shush. And here we are. Do I know his rating now? Well, he's 20, he's still 2000, I think. I think he's a doctor, Larry. All right, I was, uh, was nine, I was nine. So, but I think it's enough. I think I think at some point, as, as I'm having a great time, but I have some, I actually have some stuff to do before I go to sleep. I'll see you guys later.